Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Kleinman, staff and students, members of the public. This is the first Vice Chancellor's Open Lecture of 2013. We start this series of open lectures with a topic that's likely to resonate with everyone here. Uh, the Professor Arthur Kleinman is here to talk to you about caregiving and goodness, their broader role in society. He believes there is a need for a serious discussion about caregiving and its place in healthcare and other sectors. This is something that affects all of us in one way or another, and he's eminently suited to speak to us on this subject, as he is a leading figure in several fields of related study, from medical anthropology to cultural psychiatry to global health to social medicine and medical humanities more generally. Professor Kleinman is the Professor of Medical Anthropology and the Professor of Psychiatry in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at the Harvard Medical School. He holds the Sydney Rabb Professor of Anthropology, uh, Chair in Anthropology. He is currently the Director of the Harvard Asia Center. He's a graduate of Stanford University and Stanford Medical School with an MA in Social Anthropology from Harvard and training in psychiatry at the Massachusetts General Hospital. He's been conducting research in China from 1978 to the present and in Taiwan for a decade before that. Generations of Harvard undergraduates and medical students, master's students and residents have been privileged to be taught by Professor Kleinman. In 1973, he taught Harvard's first course in medical anthropology and in 1982, he inaugurated Harvard's first PhD program in medical anthropology. He's the author of six books, co-author of two others, co-editor of nearly 30 volumes and eight special issues of journals, and the author of over 300 articles, book chapters, reviews, and introductions. He's, Professor Kleinman is a member of the Institutes of Medicine and also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2001, he was the winner of the American Anthropology Association's highest award, the Franz Boas Award, and he is also a distinguished lifetime fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. So please join me in welcoming Professor Kleinman to this Vice Chancellor's Lecture. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for coming to listen to me. Um, in a long career, my first publications occurred 40 years ago. Uh, I have often been uh, uh, challenged with the idea that I've been 10 to 15 years ahead of my time. But actually, over 40 years, uh, things have caught up with me. So I thought for this lecture, I would look ahead not 10 or 15 years, but 100 years. So you have a, when you're thinking about what I'm going to present uh, now to you, You've got a big time horizon to think about how it might actually take place. Now let me start with something so we're all on the same page. Uh, what is caregiving? And I want to emphasize caregiving both in its broad sense and its narrow sense. If we look at the OED, um, the definition emphasizes both, emphasizes both, both the broad and the narrow. But it's characterized by attention to the needs of others, the needs of others, especially those unable to look after themselves adequately. And it also has something to do with those who are professionally involved in the provision of services. And more specifically, it talks about the needs of the child, the elderly, and the invalid. But I want you to think about that beginning, characterized by attention to the needs of others. Now, in a na somewhat narrower sense, caregiving is one of the core tasks of families, close friends, people who suffer themselves, of course, for, uh, for professionals who devote their lives to this area. In its most mundane, ordinary, and specifically uh, 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 practical mode, it's about assistance with the activities of daily living and with amelioration of pain and suffering. Now think about the activities of daily living that I'm talking about. It's about what you do in a family with a child or with a grandparent or any other member 
who needs help. It's about helping with bathing, feeding, ambulating, doing all the things that constitute life. It's also, however, about acknowledgement and affirmation. By doing these practical things, we also acknowledge the personhood of that other being, and we affirm their significance in our world. We create a relationship that is human, in part, out of caregiving. In addition, it's about emotional support and often, you know, counseling. And it's about a kind of moral solidarity. It's a responsibility that every parent knows the minute a child is born. And what every adult child knows as they see their parents, their elderly, frail parents, become unable to care for themselves. It's about a responsibility that's intended not only about the efficacy of practical interventions, though it is that, but about being there when there's nothing else that can be done. And in fact, from this list, just look at the bottom one. It's about presence, our human presence. You know, when we walk away from a relationship and we say, that person really wasn't present in that relationship. Or when we try to, we feel ourselves, it's not even trying, we feel ourselves brought out of ourselves in love, in other settings, where we feel called out of ourselves and we feel our humanness come alive. So caregiving is an existential act that defines our humanity in the broadest sense it's been recognized as such over thousands of years. It's one of the things that truly matters in living. It's obviously a basic response in context of danger and uncertainty that again define our human condition from prehistoric times to the present. Our human condition, as we all know, if we're honest, is much less controllable, much more susceptible to injury, sickness, and simple natural processes of aging, and also to a context of danger that extends from the political and the economic right through to uh, uh, the dangers of being on a roadway, for example. So our world is not dangerous and uncertain in the way it was in prehistoric times, but is dangerous and uncertain nonetheless in modern times. In a world today that is dominated by a market, by the markets and the language of the markets, the idea of a market, we're gonna come back to some of this when we look at um, what Adam Smith uh, said markets require. In an age like that, we tend to talk about caregiving as a burden. We actually measure it as a burden in terms of its uh, financial burden. We talk about it as a psychological burden. Even for professionals, we worry about burnout. But actually, caregiving is a basic part of living. Very few families will simply define caregiving as a burden. They may at certain stages. But when they think about it in its broadest sense, they see it as a way of being in the world. That's what it is, to be with others. In a global culture of cynicism, and we live in a global culture of cynicism, that's going to be one of my issues for today, and a sense of misplaced loyalty, which is so widespread. Caregiving is frequently perceived as one of the truly worthy objects of ethical commitment. There are few really worthy objects of ethical commitment that people will sign on to, but they sign on to caregiving. Here you have both a classical picture of caregiving in the return of the prodigal son, and a modern example of caregiving, HIV AIDS patient in Lesotho 
surrounded by family members. Now, in order to follow me, you're going to let me just take two minutes or three minutes to be a little bit of an academic and uh, set out some ideas that I've worked on for some time that are in my book, What Really Matters. So let's begin with what experience is. Um, we, take, we take the word experience for granted. If we take experience apart. We see that experience is characterized by an orientation of overwhelming practicality because of this sense that we're in a setting of danger and uncertainty. We're extraordinarily practical in the way we engage with others and construct our worlds of experience. But experience is also moral because there are certain things that are at stake not just for individuals, but for the collectives that we live in. And we tend to live in local worlds. Now, those local worlds we live in in 2013 are not the local worlds we lived in earlier. I, I would, I'm 70, almost 72 years of age. The world I was socialized into, the 1940s and 50s, is gone forever, both for bad and for good. Those worlds we're socialized into are neighborhoods and villages, but they're also transcontinental networks. They're workplaces and multinational corporations. They're in big institutional structures like universities and hospitals. And then they're in the everyday world of our friendship networks, our um, consumer patterns. You know, I'm a New Yorker, we always say, when the going gets tough, the tough go shopping. Shopping is part, of that, uh, is part of that local world. But in those local worlds, the very practices we carry out, how we deal with people, what we know is really at stake for us, usually what we can't say, because it differentiates us from what are the principles we're supposed to articulate. High level principles, social justice and the like, but actually in our workplace, there's no evidence that our practices develop, build social justice. So in the way I use the term moral, moral is not necessarily good, could be bad. In the apartheid world that you people were fortunate enough to overcome, uh, th there was a moral structure. That moral structure was not, we would not see that as a good moral structure but it was a commitment of practices and values by people who participated in a structure of evil. My country, slavery was an example of that, but so was the uh, discrimination of many different kinds. So I want us to think a little bit about this, that experience is moral and local. But just like moral experience, is about those, la those values we actually enact, not that we, not that we articulate. We may articulate beautiful values, but enact the darker ones. We also have an inner moral life. And that life is moral because most of us, oh, I'm not naive, not all of us, most of us want to live a life that is moral in a good sense. This means that we uh, give and receive care. It's part of what the task for us as individuals are. And we recognize that while we do that, we're enacting a moral program that we associate with the good. So caregiving is embedded both in moral experience and moral life. Now, everyone who has ever been in love or built a family knows there are certain things that money can't buy. Well, you have to qualify this a little bit. You know, I come from a Wall Street family, and I rejected the values, but stayed close to my cousins. They regard me as the most distinguished, but the least successful member of the family. <laughs> but, um, but they themselves, though they're, um, uh, they're well-to-do, are not billionaires. And they once described for me what a billionaire, what it means to become a billionaire on Wall Street. They said in very simple terms to me, 
author, it means that you'd be willing to sell your mother. Okay. So um, I know that um, uh, uh, there are some people who do believe that um, uh, uh, everything is about money. But I think most of us don't. I think there are very few of us who would sell our mothers. Patients with serious illness and their networks of caregivers know this too, because those things that really matter to us are greatly threatened and must be defended when there is serious sickness, when there's disability, when um, there's a call to help someone in great need. So there's a, a need for a serious discussion about caregiving and its place in healthcare. But as you're going to see, I want to take it out of its place in healthcare. Uh, in fact, I gave an earlier lecture at this great university to the, at the medical school about that, about its place in healthcare. But here I want to take it beyond its place in healthcare. And I want to say if we look broadly about caregiving, we take for granted that caregiving is what holds social life together. Without caregiving, in the family, in the network, even in, to some degree, in our work, and certainly in the, in the health domain, um, what would social life be like? In taking it for granted, we fail to model caregiving. We fail to come up with a model of it, a theory of it. You know, in science, scientists build models, not because they think the models are right, but in order to be able to generate knowledge, you have to have a model to challenge, to work with. Well, we, d we don't have models of caregiving. We need them. Much of our world, from leadership to governance and from domestic to foreign affairs, is modeled instead on markets, regulations, and security concerns. And we're silent about caregiving. Now, the market has an important role, but it should not reach into those quintessentials of caregiving to speak to what is most deeply human in medicine and living. We don't sell our children, and we don't sell our parents. Models without caregiving lead to cynicism and make us uncomfortable talking about caregiving in, a, in serious contexts. We're seen as naive. Actually, I think for most of my academic colleagues at Harvard and perhaps here, this would be seen as a naive way of proceeding. I'm not talking about right now the relationship of knowledge to power. I'm not talking about how bureaucracy creates the world in a certain way. Um, you'll see, I'll come back to this point because I don't think it's a naive way of talking. Well, let's start with cynicism, which so much characterizes our world. Now, cynicism, again, using the OED, and I really like this definition, is this disposed to, to disbelieve in human sincerity or goodness, sneering. I like that, I like that term. Stick with me. Cynicism is sneering. Okay. Um, ultimately, cynicism, in my view, is misanthropic and nihilistic. Now, by the way, I'm a guy who likes sardonic criticism. I'm a W.H. Auden fan. Okay. Remember what Auden said to poets: "The strong poet." dies, goes to heaven, and God reads to him the words he would have written if his life had been good. Okay? That's, not, that's not cynicism. That's, sar that's sardonic criticism. Okay. Ultimately, cynicism is misanthropic and nihilistic. It paralyzes us. It gives us a sense we cannot change the world. We forget the fact that the world is something we've made. Individuals be, can, can be cynical. Obviously, we know that we all engage people who are cynical, and we at certain times, all of us are cynical. But so can the local networks we belong to and the societies we grew up in be cynical. Um, in this regard, I can tell you about a fundamental change in my own life. I grew up in New York City in the 1940s. And New York City in the 1940s was dominated by two entirely cynical institutions. On the, on the legal side, quasi-legal side, was the Democratic Party, which controlled Tammany Hall, the center of New York City politics. And there was a cynical sense 
that nothing could change politically because of the, of the way that this uh, party functioned. For example, when I was a little kid, only nine years of age, I was given $10 in singles by the local precinct captain of the Democratic Party who said, you see those drunks, Arthur? You give each of them a dollar, tell them to vote Democrat. It was on election day, okay? And the second organization that, was, uh, that produced enormous citizen was the mafia, which infiltrated not just the waterfront, but every single area of business. I, I remember when I was 15 years of age, I worked for my uncle who ran a, a famous meat packing plant called High Grade Meats. And one day, two big guys went into his office and I saw my uncle come out later, and he was white, ashen. And I said, what happened, uncle? And he said, those are the mafia. They threatened to break my legs. Okay? They wanted a cut of all the businesses. And the idea of that time was nothing could change. Well, it did change. It did change for the good. It's not to say there's no mafia in New York, but it's nothing like it was in the past. And although the Democratic Party is, uh, is still active and powerful in New York, it has challenges and it's changed in many ways, and I'm proud to say I'm a lifetime Democrat. In fact, I can honestly say I've never voted for a Republican. Okay. Now, so our local worlds and networks can be cynical, and when they're cynical, nothing happens, and when they're changed, everything becomes possible. But I want to return to ourselves because this is about you and me. So the concept of our self being divided is very, very well known. In fact, it's a trope of modernity. That we have an interiority that's split and also discordant, if that not downright contradictory with itself over many things. And our own personal experience is often that we can feel this. That our personhood is fractured and at odds. We have divided emotions and we have hidden conflicted values. And such outstanding thinkers as the verse of Sigmund Freud, William James, W.H.R. Rivers, and Woody Allen have advanced the idea of a divided self and shown its association with modernity. And this is a widely accepted idea. But how does cynicism work with a divided self? There's a tension between two aspects of ourself frequently, that cynical aspect that's willing to be a collaborator, to go along with things, because it advances certain aspects of our agenda, and a more idealistic self, which knows there are values we want to enact, but is frightened about whether we enact them in a setting that will not accept them, and therefore will end up uh, excluded or injured in some way. So it, these parts of ourselves require an environment, a local world that we just talked about, of moral experience that will allow the non-cynical parts of ourselves to emerge. I showed this earlier in the day in another talk. This is the only time that uh, I know of that Picasso painted the head of a, me of a medical student. Okay. Um, it's characterized by one eye being open and one eye closed. And Picasso himself indicated that he meant to say that the medical school student on one hand was called into the world of suffering, but on the other hand had to either protect himself from being overwhelmed by suffering or that she would um, want to be able to develop her own self-interests and not um, uh, 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 have to think only about others. Um, of course, there's a danger to this that you can't have medical schools. Um, we won't mention which. Uh, but there are plenty of them in my country, in which both eyes close in the course of medical education. Okay. So mine is an argument for cultivating the part of the self that's not cynical and for changing local values so that aspirations to improve the world are externally supported. That's why um, you can sit back and relax, because I've suggested it may take 100 years. Okay. But you remember um, the Chinese saying, a march of 10,000 li, 10,000 miles, begins with a single step. Okay. The context of the local world that we live in strongly influences which side of that self is going to be elaborated. 
Hence, developing a facilitating local world is as important as cultivating the self. And I want to emphasize both of these. So we're, we're in a university. If we think about the origins of the university, the idea of knowledge construction, which is what a university is about, and knowledge transmission was not just an idea of knowledge for its own sake. It was taken for granted, as I'm going to show you, that it was knowledge to do something in the world, to make for a better world, to deal with social problems, to engage those aspects of life that could be improved and changed. And there was the idea always in the university of the cultivation of the self. That is, that we would cultivate students in such a way that they would be technically competent, that their knowledge, their technical knowledge would increase greatly, but that they would also have an ethical sensibility. I want to link this up to the idea of goodness. In America, there's an outstanding writer who's African American, probably one of our greatest writers today. And her name is Toni Morrison. She's a, she won the Nobel Prize. And recently, she lectured at Radcliffe Institute at Harvard on contemporary literature's treatment of goodness, which she said that contemporary literature treated goodness as weakness, as pitiful. And these are her words. In fact, I, I had dinner with her right after the lecture. As, as, quote, scornful of the monotony and the stupidity of good intentions. She went on to say, when goodness appears, it is always with a note of apology in its hand, and it has struggle speaking its name. Morrison argued for the importance of goodness in literature. Over time, these last 40 years, she said, I've become more and more invested in making sure acts of goodness produce language Expressions of goodness are never trivialized in my work and never incidental in my writing. In fact, I want them to have life-changing properties and to illuminate decisively the moral questions embedded in the narrative. It was important to me that none of the acts of goodness be handled as comedy or irony. You know, irony is the great trope of our era, not surprising in an era of cynicism. And they are seldom mute, she said. This is, by the way, from a novelist, if you know Tony's novels, who is incredibly critical, incredibly critical novelist. She's telling you that she handles goodness in a certain way. Now, caregiving is a form of goodness, I want to argue. And as such, it's one of the noble acts of living. Rather than be embarrassed by speaking of caregiving as naive and unintellectual, as trivial, let it be the model or organizing principle for everyday life. Now just follow me on this a little bit. I'm not asking you to stop making money or not be aggressive to your neighbor. Just, just uh, wait. you know, um, we all know about aggression. After all, the modern definition of a university, at least amongst its faculty, is a faculty that share only one thing, a complaint over parking. But, the, uh, uh, but rather, sit back and just, uh, just bear with me on this thought. So rather than be embarrassed by speaking of caregiving as naive and unintellectual, as trivial, let it be the model for organize, as an organizing principle for everyday life. Let's take the, the actual motto of one of the great high schools in the United States, maybe our greatest high school, Phillips Academy Andover in Massachusetts. It's, it's, it's motto, non sibi, not the self, not the self. The self acquires its strength, resilience, and powers through others. This world is about our connections with others. If you know anything about Chinese culture, the Chinese believe that the essence of culture is guanxi, guanxi, connections, which the Chinese de ref uh, define as runqing, moral connections. When psychological and sociological studies ask American teenagers, as many have, why they focus on the self, they make it clear at the end it is because they want to be influential with others, have a good friend, be noticed, have status, 
do things vis-a-vis -vis others. A world that brings out a commitment to caregiving is different than a world that makes it impossible. Practices have embedded logics. The logic of choice argues uh, uh, Anne-Marie Moll in her very fine book, The Logic of Care. And she says, writing about medicine, I do not question choice in general, but rather the generalization of choice. Other ideas like good care suffer from this. In healthcare, practices designed to foster patient choice erode existing practices that were established to ensure good care. A logic of choice allows neglect, while a logic of care does not. Hey, look at that. A logic of choice allows neglect. Right? You come to my city, Boston, which is a the educational capital of the United States, and you see neglect right and left. Right outside our medical school, right outside our, our um, main university campus, you'll see the homeless uh, neglected. There's a logic of choice in the economic structure of my country and those cities, but there's a logic of choice that leads to neglect, and the logic of care is hard to see. What are the implications beyond health care then? Let's push this idea of caregiving and goodness in the world beyond health care. Now, let's look at the implications for freedom. Bear with me now. I'm going to be a little technical again. What is freedom without caregiving? I have a colleague in sociology at Harvard um, who wrote a great book on freedom, Orlando Patterson. He himself is uh, a Caribbean uh, African American. He conceptualizes freedom as a construction. One needs to be studied historically to ground the philosophy of it. He argues that freedom cannot be the fundamental moral principle because it leads to both harm and good. Try as they might, he writes, and Western philosophers and moralists have tried mightily, the fact remains that we have been unable to transcend the evils that come with the blessings of freedom. Now let's look at Adam Smith. Virtually every economist arguing for free markets begins with Adam Smith, and most of them have never really read or read in depth the wealth of nations, where Smith makes it clear that you cannot have a political economy without a moral economy. Smith valorized the freedom to exchange goods and ideas outside the constraints of mercantilism and other forms of oppression. Early Enlightenment thinking noted that a system based on division of labor leads to gross inequity and provisions of care must be included for those relegated to the tedious tasks. Smith's faith, writes my colleague Emma Rothschild, a great economic historian and the wife of another great colleague of mine, Amartya Sen. Smith's faith is in the mildness and thoughtfulness of most individual men and women, usually not pursuing their interests in oppressive ways usually wishing to live in a society where others are not deprived. This and little more is the foundation of economic freedom. It's a pious hope, as well as a shortcoming of liberal economic thought. The idea that, that Adam Smith actually has was that you would have something approaching, he didn't use the word caregiving, something approaching what I've called caregiving giving as the basis to be able to have a, mar a market. But we've allowed the market to generalize into every part of life. Now, I think one of the great examples of caregiving in its broader political as well as its narrower medical frame was Pinnell releasing people from their chains in uh, psychiatric asylums. And this is still one of the great needs in the world. So my concluding question is, if caregiving starts in the family and builds outwards, what are the implications of care as a broader ethic? What are the implications of care as a broader ethic? And not just an ethic in the sense of a system of ethical thinking, but as a way of organized politics, as a way of organize our political worlds. What does it mean to 
think about raising caregiving to a model that would be side by side with, maybe even at times be seen as more important than a rational choice model of what human beings are about. What it be, would it be like for governance and leadership for those individuals engaged in roles from uh, um, managers of uh, agencies, uh, middle managers in corporations, people who run school systems, people who run hospital systems, people in concern with the energy domain to take a caregiving ethic. Let me give you an example actually from the energy domain so you can think of it outside of the medical domain. There's an outstanding petroleum engineer in the United States by the name of um, Vikram Rao in North Carolina who spent most of his years with an organization that really is a, has a terrible and largely deserved uh, reputation, Halliburton and Company, okay? But Rao sort of liberated himself from Halliburton and has written a really remarkable book on um, what he calls distributed energy, which he sees as the future of the world, which actually uses um, sources like fracking, recognizing that it can be done in ways that are more environmentally protecting, to generate natural gas and oil in the small settings. This is actually being used now by the American military, this idea that every military base is being built now, so it has its own energy. It runs its own grid. It's independent. And this can be done, Rao believes, for villages, for small towns, for large cities. His argument that the distributed energy will change the whole nature of the way we think of living and how we pay for resources because this turns out to be an extraordinarily efficient, practical, and inexpensive way of generating energy. Now, if we took a caregiving model, we'd say, my God, this is the way to go. But if we think about the obstacles to caregiving, and we look at the market model as one of those obstacles, we recognize that every major power generating system Every, every energy company concerned with um, generating substantial profits is going to be threatened and is at this very moment threatened by this idea. So that as one thinks about how would you organize an idea of goodness and an idea of caregiving in the political domain, we'd have to really think through what are the politics of caregiving? What are the politics of um, governance with the idea of goodness, of doing good for others, a building in that moral sense as well as in a technical sense. I think this is going to be one of the great issues in the future. And the question is now, how do we build the models out to challenge the other dominant models of our time? Surely the market model, but also the security model, which has become so, so um, much part of the distrust that our world is about. How can we present a more practical, useful, and at the same time liberating model of goodness in the world that extends out from families and networks into the political domain? If we realize that we are the political domain, families and networks are the political domain, then it would seem that this is a possibility. But I, you know, I, I'm not here simply to court controversy, though I'd like to do that. That's part of who I am. I, I'm here also to, to recognize that this is not going to be easy, and it's going to be a long term, as I said. You can breathe a sigh of relief. It's going to take at least 100 years to get us in this direction to move us a little further than where we are today. But I have, I have the sense of optimism that the arc of history is bending in this direction. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Kleinman has uh, agreed kindly to 
uh, engage in a discussion and take uh, questions and answers. I'm sure you'll have views as much as questions. So, um, it occurs to me that the opposite of caregiving is doing harm. Now, with this long-term vision of a caring society, what do we do about harmful industries, the arms industry, the tobacco industry, the junk food industry, entire industries that far from caring for people are actively doing harm? Would that be part of yeah. your projection for 100 years, Professor? Well, let, let me, um, you know, bend that question back to you, uh, which is, I, I agree totally with you as, as the, you know, what are the obstacles? So l let me give you a simple, you know, I do my research in China. China has a huge problem today with uh, cigarette smoking. It's in the process of building the greatest epidemic of uh, cancers and other health problems related to smoking that the world has ever seen. It has two ministries which represent two parts of the government. It has a health ministry which has a serious anti-smoking campaign. Okay? And it has a ministry of forestry which runs the tobacco monopoly, which is the government's greatest source of wealth. Okay? So that's a problem. The Minister of Forestry, when he calls the Minister of Finance, I'm told, gets a call within a half an hour back. The Minister of Health waits for a day or two. Okay. So there's no question about the fact that you put your finger on a very important issue. I, I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm not inattentive to the fact that the world runs on power and not just uh, the power of physical energy, but the power, the power of politics and economics. How, the, how will that change? I have no idea. And the question is um, um, uh, one, however, that there is you know, reason to be somewhat optimistic about because there is now a, a general concern that these things have to change, that we have to change these things. Whereas China's having a, a hell of a time right now on smoking cessation, in America, 55 million people have stopped smoking over the last uh, 35 years. That's an, incredible, that's an incredible shift. And so, how did that happen? We can say, how did that happen? Some internalization of caregiving ideas as it relates to health and smoking occurred in the cultural domain. So I think it, it begins in some way as a cultural change. And then it ha you know, ways have to be figured out to have political and economic effects. But I think working this out, how, how can we do this? How can we build caregiving as a model side by side with uh, uh, the market model? Um, I think it's something you know, for people who are in business faculties to be working on, for um, uh, 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 those who are economic theorists to work on, for others who, work, or who are concerned with institutions and how institutions function. Uh, the thing that's astonishing about, it seems to me, about institutions are two sides of, of, uh, of institutions. One is we know that institutions, as Max Weber said, would come to dominate our times because they could generalize, quantify, uh, be more, quote unquote, objective, and they would produce much greater efficiency than anything we had ever seen before. And Weber said the downside of it would be that we would end up in an iron cage of rationality there would be an algorithmic world in which we just followed rules, rational rules, and uh, that would lead to a, a lessening of, um, of um, tradition, sentiment, and spontaneity. And so, um, to some degree, Weber was right, but to some degree, he was wrong. He, th he thought institutions, uh, uh, economic institutions, would replace religion. Religion has never had a bigger day in, than in the United States right now. Uh, okay. at the same time that economic institutions have had a big day. And if you speak to people, if you speak to um, uh, uh, people on the streets who work in institutions, you meet many, many people who want to see their institution shift their mode to emphasize um, caregiving, something similar to caregiving, or concern for goodness in the world, side by side with um, their economic uh, motives. Now the question is, how do they do that? And again, that's not, 
you know, I'm, I'm taking things that you're, you're hearing a doctor speak to you. Imagine a doctor is saying, with all the problems we have in medicine, we're, I'm saying, hey, let's use some models in medicine to look at the world, okay? That's about as far as I can go. Yeah. What would be the role of religion and religious practice in this kind of model? Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. And I think that um, the question is, um, what would be the role of religion, religious practice, in this um, set of ideas I set out? Morality has, uh, in, in the sense of, of, of ethics, that is the moral associated with the good now, not with malign moral, moral morals, but with our aspirations to do good and, to, to, and our actual caregiving practices. R religion has a real role to play. and has played an enormous role um, in, in, in anchoring uh, um, that sentiment and giving opportunity for it. You take global health, the global health domain. Most people in the world don't realize this. But global health would be nowhere where it wa is today were it not for the religious roots of the people who have worked in it. Even the most contemporary people in global health, many of them come out of strong religious backgrounds. Okay? So there's no question in my mind religion has a role to play in this. But religion also has a problem on the other side. You know, that's what... Um, um, some theologians have said that religion is such bad news because it's such good news. Uh, I mean, you know, it's got some, it's got, it's, it also contributes to the problems that we're talking about in the area of religious fundamentalism, exclusivity, um, the fact that um, if you're not with us, you're outside. Maybe you're not fully human if you're outside who we are. So religion has, is, it comes in on both sides here, but there's no question, I think, that religions have a, have a powerful role to play in this, in this area. Um, I was wondering whether you could uh, say a few words about the moral status of goodness and caregiving towards the animal world and also nature at large. I, 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 um, my son should give the lecture because he's a, he's a great uh, pollution researcher and he's interested in animals. This is not mine. I, I'm interested in people. Uh, I, I don't, you know, I want, I don't want the animals to disappear, but I, I'm not an expert in that area. In fact, I can tell you of one error I once made, which taught me something. I once um, complained uh, in, the, in the New York Times about the lack of caregiving in medicine. And I said that medicine was increasingly becoming a veterinary practice. And the next day, I was contacted by the American Veterinaries Association, <laughs> which told me, which told me, they told me, and they sent me a, a, a report on this, that actually veterinarians give good care, are caregivers to their animals. And so I recognize that there are plenty of people in the world who are deeply concerned about uh, uh, this with animals. And I would imagine this is a part of caregiving and a part of goodness. And, and uh, I, I know that um, in my family, as my kids grew up, a large dog who had a habit of running away and retrieving other people's things, a large dog played a central role in humanizing my family. And so I, 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 I'm with you in that regard. Yeah. I have two questions. The first one is very superficial, but uh, if you could tell us why you've come to Cape Town, of all places, and what you like about it. Okay, stop this. Uh, oh, let me okay. Tell, let me do one. I'm coming to Cape Town because I'm on my way to be with my girlfriend in Australia. Okay. Uh, I have a joke, but it's very offside. Okay, the second question, uh, you talk about goodness. Uh, a thought I've had in my mind for the last year or so, growing up, the button Hollywood and Bollywood and Nollywood and all these people were pressing was that uh, Nollywood is Nigeria, just in case no one knows. Uh, that the button which was being pushed is that good will always triumph over evil. Uh, the perspective I've found, or personally, in the last two years is that the good team doesn't win. The team that wins has the opportunity to write history. So what I was thinking was, where are we going to find this goodness which you speak of? It's you mentioned religion, but where is it going to come from, the okay. standard? Yeah. Well, let's look at examples of where it has come from. In my own country, 
Think of the civil rights movement. Think of the, the work of um, not just Martin Luther King, but of the uh, black church in America was based on an idea of caregiving, of caregiving for blacks. Where did NGOs and voluntarism come in communist China, in, in, um, in the People's Republic of China? It didn't come from the state. It came from AIDS patients who could not be treated in hospitals, who, got, who couldn't find doctors who would take care of them, who took care of themselves. And after they generated NGOs, NGOs became possible in China. Where did voluntarism in China come from? Individual voluntarism. Wasn't allowed in China. In 1976, China had the most devastating earthquake in modern times in Tanshan, in Tangshan. 750,000 people died in that earthquake. There was no voluntarism. The state disregarded the earthquake. They didn't want the news, etc. After the uh, Sichuan earthquake, the Wuntuan earthquake of several years ago, they allowed voluntarism. Why did they allow voluntarism? Because there was an outcry by the new middle class. The great development in Asia, and I'm an Asianist, not an Africanist, so you forgive me, I can't give examples from Africa. The great development in Asia is the building of middle classes. China now has gone from a terribly poor country in 40 years to a country that has almost 400 million middle class people and will have the world's greatest middle class in 15 years. It will have almost 600 million middle class people. That's an amazing story. India, also an amazing story in the middle class. That's a, India is a sad story because of inequalities also, so that you have simultaneously in India the greatest percentage of obese children and the greatest percentage of malnourished children in a site at the same moment. That's a sad story, but the building of a middle class is also a great story in India and in Indonesia and throughout Asia. And that middle, those middle classes have demanded greater care for themselves from the state and have gotten it. The states have responded in ways they haven't in the past. So that's a sign of, uh, of, of things that change. Now that goodness has to be fit into a political system, has to fit into an economic system, has to be part of power. So how do we produce that? Well, you have a democracy, an electorate, an electorate comes out of families. They come out of settings where either care is present or they recognize the absence and the need for it. And the opportunity here is to articulate it, to develop a language of it, to project it, to vote for it, to move it, to demand it, to protest for it. All those things are possible. And at various times, we've done those things. We've done those things. But we've become incredibly quiet in recent times. And we've allowed the narrowest, crudest, and most ruthless of market models to dominate us. And I think this is one of the great challenges for us is how do we open up space in a marketized world, in a commercialized world, that allow us to have more room for caregiving. If you're interested in this, read a book that I just did with some of my former students called Deep China, The Moral Life of the Person. Um, another American voice yeah. uh, who lives here now. Uh, a question about your statement regarding presence and the power of presence being, um, being someplace you don't have to be in terms of volunteerism. Yeah. And those, those two together. Is, is the whole concept of volunteering out of uh, industries, out of organizations, out of our own private lives, out of churches, organizations, is that one arena in which we can move forward in yeah. setting this new global yeah. model? Yeah, I think volunteerism. Uh, volunteerism is a great example. In our own country, uh, 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 you're an American, I'm an American. In our own country, you'll remember that out of the great second awakening, religious awakening in the 19th century, came medical missionaries, the Boy Scouts, the American Red Cross, and many other ways of systematically organizing volunteerism. Okay? And today we're seeing a wave of volunteerism, of humanitarian assistance. Now, it's not unproblematic. It has, and there's a, there's a building anthropological critique 
of some of the bad things that happen with uh, humanitarian assistance that is inappropriate in local settings or that really works on its own, own behalf or forgets about where money should be applied and not. But there are also a sterling examples of uh, humanitarianism. My former students, Jim Kim Paul Far and Paul Farmer, together with a, um, uh, Ophelia Dahl, started an NGO um, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, called Partners in Health, which is active in Rwanda, in Haiti, in Lesotho, in Malawi, and other places, in the, in, in the prisons in Russia, where, where, uh, in Siberia, where it works with uh, terribly poor uh, prison populations who are overwhelmed, decimated by MDRTB, is a great example of part of a moral movement today in America of people who want to do good, largely young students, who see global health as, the, as a way of doing this. And we see many other examples of volunteerism. So I'm with you entirely. I think volunteerism can be one of the ways that this works. But we also recognize that all good interventions have what uh, Robert Merton, the great American sociologist, called unintended consequences. And we have to be careful about the fact that that, that volunteerism also has unintended consequences. I really hate to add to the chain of another American, but that's what I am, so um, I now live in Cape Town. Um, yeah, don't be ashamed of being an American. Hey, I mean, no, I just right, meant I'm not ashamed, although many instances I am ashamed, I have to say. Um, but I, I just, uh, yeah, your, your um, presentation really resonates with uh, the work that I'm doing. Um, and I'm wondering if, if, uh, if you've explored um, institutional theory at all. Um, because that really digs into, it's a, a field that's really digging into how institutions are created um, over time. And the, the focus of our work is looking at um, that most institutions are built out of fear, not love. And, and most of the institutional um, research is looking at how institutions are built, but through that lens of, of fear as being the sort of DNA of institutions. And we're looking at how can we create institutions that are built on things like compassion and love. And, and I th think based on what we're seeing is that, that, that it takes a, a very different strategy to build institutions out of those things that it does out of fear. And that we don't really know how to build institutions out of those positive qualities and that um, and that maybe there are some examples that, that we can start looking at that, that are possibly quite small, but that could um, you know, give us glimpses into how do we build those institutions out of those positive qualities. So I guess I just wanted to offer institutional theory as a yeah, potential yeah. doorway into um, really understanding how do we build these institutions out of, um, so bureaucracies are fear-based. Um, how do we build something that's so durable as a bureaucracy, but a compassionate, yeah, well, I, 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 would, I would leave it to you to be able to answer your own question because you, know, this, you clearly thought through this in a deep way and I, I'm not an institutional specialist. But I would, I would call to mind the work of my colleague Michael Hertzfeld who's written a great book on, uh, on and what he calls bureaucratic in indifference. And you can, you can ask the question of how is it we, we end up with people in bureaucracies who become indifferent to the needs of others for which the bureaucracy was intended to serve, and, um, and medicine is a great example of this. Of, I, I just said earlier at your medical school, look, I'm sure it scandalized them, that as a medical educator over um, almost five decades, I've come to the conclusion that based on, and there's a lot of research to support this, that medical schools actually disable medical students in the, in the domain of caregiving, okay? Which is a terrible idea when you're, when you're a medical educator that you're, do, you're actually doing something that's harmful in this regard. And, and I, I do think it, in, in, my, in this instance, uh, uh, medicine, its roots are not, we're not out of fear. Its roots actually, the roots of medicine are in religion and not an idea of religion as fearful of something, but in an aspiration, aspirational sense of change. And, and, and yet, what, what produces this indifference over time? And I think that Michael had his finger on this, that there's something about the institutional structure of our relationship to what we do, the culture that's created, 
the worlds that we form that lead to this indifference as a byproduct of being part of a large organization. And uh, take a look at that, and maybe you can put that together with those other ideas. Uh, Arthur, I want to give you a small token of our appreciation, the one that uh, I hope will not only remind you of the University of Cape Town and South Africa and give you other reasons to come here, other than <laughs> a stopping point en route to Australia, um, and to say thank you very much for most stimulating lecture and uh, certainly a prompt to thinking in ways that I suspect many of us are afraid to think in because of the accusation of naivety, the accusation that this isn't uh, serious uh, intellectual, uh, empirical, uh, grounded theory. And your challenge to us uh, is all the more important for that. Thank you very much. <laughs>